Hello, everyone. Welcome to our kayak fishing webinar. Today's topic is choosing the right kayak and some boater safety and some other regulations you need to know about. So um, if you at any point have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat. Myself or the facilitator will try to get those questions asked to our guest speakers and get those answered for you. Um, so yeah, let's get this show on the road. If Chris and Callie from Canoe, Kentucky will turn their camera on, they're gonna go over types of boats and features that you might need or not think about when you're choosing your first fishing kayak. Now, these guys, they work, live and breathe this stuff so they can answer any question you have. So guys, take it away. Hi everybody, um, Chris and Callie here from Canoe, Kentucky. Um, we're here to talk to you a little bit about fishing kayaks, the different styles, and uh, what makes a fishing kayak a fishing kayak. Um, I'm going to start. So, what makes a kayak a fishing kayak? Real simple, you go fishing with it. So, anything you can take a fishing pole with, it's a fishing kayak. Now, you can get really specific into different types of fishing kayaks, and I'm going to let Callie expand on that. So, Callie, what types of fishing kayaks are there? Yeah, so uh, many different styles out there uh, in comparison of a sit on top versus a sit inside style fishing kayak. Sit on top, you're sitting up above the water a bit more. Um, a sit inside style kayak, you will be seated inside of the cockpit of a kayak. Uh, your legs may be inside uh, as well. You're sitting a little lower, generally more stable, uh, but we'll talk about the differences of widths of kayaks and what that comes into play. Um, there's also a difference in whether you're wanting pedal, paddle, or power. Uh, power being a motor, like a trolling motor or electric motor on a kayak can be added on, uh, not all, but many uh, do have that availability. Pedaling, just like a bike or uh, that motion uh, with your feet, so you're more hands-free from your paddle to be able to cast and to really, um, you know, reel in those fish and really hit the spots you're looking for. Pedal kayaks aren't always uh, the best for low running streams. Uh, you have to be mindful of, of how low uh, the motor or the pedal may reach uh, into the water to be able to utilize those. And then of course, most commonly um, paddle. So using a kayak paddle uh, to uh, maneuver yourself in the waterway. Right, so uh, one of the most common questions we get is, does it matter what length my kayak is? Like how long is it? How does that affect the, the paddling of it? So Callie, can you expand a little bit? What, how does the length affect our kayaking? Yeah, when you get into um, uh, shorter lengths around 10 foot or so, um, what you lose in that is tracking of a kayak. So if you're out on a big lake uh, or a river, um, that may be more difficult to keep straight. The longer the kayak is, uh, generally the better it tracks. So when you get into the 12 or even 14 foot lengths of a kayak, um, you can have better tracking and maneuverability on that side. That also comes into play with the width of a kayak. So a very wide kayak will be much more stable for somebody, um, one where you're sitting lower to the water. We do carry many options here and you'll see tons of different styles and, and brands out there of kayaks that may have a raised seat on them. Uh, that in turn uh, affects your center of gravity on a kayak. Uh, so the higher you sit out of the water, of course, it may feel a little bit more tippy. The more you paddle, the more you get used to it, um, the better it'll feel. Uh, we offer demos and we work very closely, of course, with Fish and Wildlife to allow folks to try out kayaks at different programs. So there's no better way to get a feel for them than sitting in a kayak, get it out on the water, um, and see what's best for you when you're trying to uh, decide what features you're looking for as well. So how does, uh, we talked about, you talked about the length of a kayak, what about width? Like what, what are we looking for in an ideal width? of a fishing kayak in particular. Yeah, so a lot of that comes into play of how much gear you may want to take with you. Are you planning to do an overnight style paddling trip or camping trip um, where you have extra gear, a lot of tackle, um, and then of course the weight of the paddler. When you get into a tandem style kayak, so that's a two-seater kayak, uh, your capacities can, can be much larger to accommodate that. Uh, there are also many solo kayaks. You're ideally probably looking in the 34 to 36 range, if you inch range uh, for the width, if you're looking for a very stable kayak. Mm -hmm. uh, when you get down into the 33, 32 inch uh, width range, uh, that does change a little bit. But again, very important to consider what you might take with you, what you're going to have on the kayak, um, whether that's a dog or a small human with you, um, that can all change where the weight's distributed. So if I'm uh, looking to go on a lake, 
uh, what what would be my ideal length and width for, for a, a boat? And then the same, if I'm looking to go on moving water, what what where should I be? Ideal is a tough question to answer because what comes into play when looking at whether you're you're getting a fishing kayak or more of a uh, exploration style, but like to fish just a little bit, uh, a lot of that is how you're going to haul the kayak, where you're going to store it. Um, inflatable kayaks are a great option for folks um, that may not have a garage or may not have racks or a truck to be able to haul those. Uh, so they can be fairly um, uh, different as far as your needs and your expectations you want to get out of it. When looking at kayaks, um, finding one that has more of a, a flat hole designed as opposed to rocker. So rocker is on the bow and the stern of a kayak. When that's more lifted out of the water, that kayak is more maneuverable for moving water streams like Elkhorn Creek. When you get to flat water areas like a lake, um, having a more flat hole design allows for stability and tracking on that type of waterway. Cool. When I'm thinking about once I've, I've made my purchase, I've got my kayak, what are some other accessories I might want to look at? Yeah. Um, accessories that are most common, of course, having a properly fitted life jacket uh, or commonly known as a PFD, personal flotation device, uh, is very, very important. Not only having one that's comfortable for you to wear, it has to be properly sized for you. And again, encourage you to sit in a seat, sit in the kayak, make sure your seated position and your paddling position is just as comfortable as your, your standing and moving around position in a, in a life jacket. Again, there's no better way to see how it fits and feels for you yourself um, than to get in it, try some different sty styles and sizes. When looking at life jackets, I do have a couple behind me here. You can um, find life jackets with a lot of pockets, a lot of um, accessory management options that you see. So for your, your tools or your nips or anything that you're wanting to take with you. You do also have some that are more confined um, in a pocket area here, um, or there's some that have no pockets. So really, again, what are you wanting to take with you? What's important for you? Folks that do a lot of videography or, or take a lot of photos, whether you take a GoPro, um, you know, having those items where you need them uh, is very important. Moving on down the list is looking at a paddle for your kayak. When we do size up paddles, it's very important to take into consideration the width of the kayak that we've mentioned many times, uh, the paddler's height. We're uh, lucky enough to have some phenomenal options here in our store, um, and I know across many other outfitters as well, that have adjustable length paddles. So you can adjust maybe from 240 centimeters to 260 centimeters. Your length is very important. You want to have a kayak paddle that um, is comfortable for you to utilize uh, while out on the water. So what about uh, transportation? How do I get, no matter what vehicle I'm hauling it on, how do I get it to the water? Yeah, transportation is one of those big hangups for some folks, but also they may have it uh, figured out as far as what other accessories you may need to add along with you. So for transportation, most commonly uh, for a fishing kayak, we see a lot of folks just throw it in the bed of their pickup truck. There's options as far as truck bed extenders that extend the length of your, your truck bed and allow you to support your kayak a bit more on those. Trailers are another great option, especially if you have a, a, a quiver of, of kayaks or you're taking out some friends and family along with you to be able to haul more gear and haul more boats with you. There's also options like roof racks. Those will be on top of your car. Some uh, vehicles do have factory roof racks already on there, or, or crossbars, I should say. You really want to check the rating of your crossbars. Um, they are, some aren't rated enough uh, for the weight of some heavy fishing kayaks, so you really want to pay attention to that. Roof racks are what actually support or hold your kayak. When you get into some larger fishing kayaks, uh, if you've, you've done some research on, on those, the J-style hooks aren't always going to work with the design of fishing kayaks, so you're more commonly going to rest those on some cradles um, or just on the bars itself. All right, so let's talk a little bit about some just of these other accessories we have laying here on the table. Um, so this right here, um, what, why don't you explain to the audience what that is? So when you're thinking about what you want to take with you on your kayak, uh, you really 
want to consider how you're going to properly store it. Um, common, common occurrence um, is someone flips their kayak and loses all of their gear and equipment. Fishing itself is a big investment. When you get into fishing, kayak fishing, that is then that next investment of your boat, your paddle, your life jacket. Um, having proper items that attach your, your valuables to your boat is very, very important. This is just one example of a rod holder. It fits nicely on most fishing kayaks have gear tracks. So those are like a metal or aluminum track on a kayak that this can sit in and attach to. You can either have that in front of your seat or behind you, uh, whichever is best for you to reach and grab your items from. When looking at rod holders, you really want to look at what type of uh, fishing pole you're using. So whether that's a bait caster, a spinning reel, a fly rod, all can have different or better rod holders um, than this one here. But this is a fairly universal option for folks um, that we carry here in the store. You can also look at items. Um, I had mentioned, you know, line management tools. Uh, there's tons of different styles out there as far as what works best for you. This can easily carabiner and attach to your, your life jacket. Um, so an easy grab spot to, to clip any lines you may have uh, to quickly get your next uh, lure in place for you as well. Um, what about pedal drives? We kind of touched on, on types of kayaks and we've talked a little bit about um, different styles, but um, who's the ideal person to, to use a pedal drive and, and where's the ideal place to use a pedal drive? Yeah, ideal places for pedal drive kayaks will definitely be some of those deeper rivers or lakes. You really want to be mindful of the waterways that you're paddling on uh, as if it's prone to having logs protruding from the water or tree limbs down. Um, can your pedal drive handle hitting some of those things? Can it retract out of the water? Uh, definitely things to consider. Uh, the ideal person that wants a pedal drive kayak, when you get into those, they are a bit more expensive. Um, there is no one ideal person for a pedal drive kayak. It's what's comfortable for you. So again, if you're really focused on being a bit more hands-free and using your feet to move you around, um, that would be a great option for you. And again, the type of waterway you're wanting to paddle most. The cool thing about a lot of pedal kayaks is actually that a lot of those pedal units can be removed from the kayak. So if you were wanting to also utilize it on lower running streams or moving water, you ultimately just don't have to take that with you, which I think is a great option that a lot of these uh, manufacturers offer for folks. All right. Is there anything else advice you would want to give a beginning kayak fisherman? So what, what's your one takeaway that, that they need to be aware of looking into getting into the sport? Yeah, I've got loads of uh, <laughs> tips and tricks and information for folks. Um, and anyone you come to talk to uh, here at Canoe Kentucky or at the Fish and Wildlife Department can, can ha share their tips and tricks as well. But I always encourage folks, go out and pat paddle your kayak or pedal your kayak. Uh, see what you may want to take with you first. Do your research, get in on them, try them. The reason I, can, I, I ask folks to, to go out and paddle their kayak is you want to become a kayaker first, fishing second. Um, you may be phenomenal at fishing, know the areas you're going to, but the moment you step into a fishing kayak, um, that can change how you cast, where you cast to, the access you have to the water, of course. Um, so get out there and paddle first, learn how to do a self-rescue out of your kayak, practice falling out. Uh, a lot of very wide, stable kayaks can be very, very difficult to tip, um, but we always encourage folks to get out and learn the safety techniques, practice um, what it takes to get back into your boat um, and, and do your best uh, to wear your life jacket. All right. What works well for a taller kayaker, so someone really tall, and then someone that might be a little bit bigger? Yeah, when we look at those kayaks, um, ones that are a sit-on-top style uh, may have a very clear open deck style plan to them. Uh, so you may not see a lot of consoles in front, you may not have foot pegs in front. Uh, so making sure that you're comfortable. Again, sit in the kayak if you can, wherever you're looking to purchase it. Uh, get out on the water in those as well to make sure there's enough foot space. When it comes to pedal kayaks, however, uh, there is certain distances from the pedals in the seat that some kayaks can adjust for, whether that raises the seat or lowers it, or it can be shifted fore and aft on the kayak. We have found that some kayaks aren't suitable for shorter paddlers, 
that cannot reach the foot pedals or cannot reach a foot peg, so that may need to go to a second option. So having a, a good selection of your pros and cons you're looking for or not looking for in a kayak um, and having that list ready to go. So if there's a second best option that may work for you if you're taller and can't fit your first option. What you can also do uh, are select items like a casting bar. So there are stand-up bars that allow you to help yourself stand up and lean on to cast. They can also help you attach your uh, paddle to them while you're standing so it's still readily available. You don't have to reach back down near the water to grab it. Um, and so those, those definitely help when standing. Your confidence and your stability gives you something to hold on to while you're up there fishing. Awesome. Um, I think the last question we had is how do I transport it to the water? So are there carts? Are there wheels? What, what are options do we have? Yeah, I had mentioned earlier that uh, trailers, of course, and then roof racks or the bed of your truck. I forgot to mention kayak dollies or carts, uh, commonly known as landing gear as well. These are all terms you may see or hear out there um, across the board. So a kayak cart's very important. When you get to fishing kayaks, you want to steer away from uh, scupper plug carts. The reason being is that puts a lot of pressure on the scupper holes uh, of a kayak. And so having a cart that fully supports the weight of your kayak is very important. So there are some that can attach to it. Uh, there's many options that can break down and be stored in your kayak. There's some that just lift the wheels out of the water and are attached while you're out there paddling. And then you just bring them back down when you're ready to load off the ramp as well. Uh, so making sure it fully supports the weight of your kayak, um, the accessories you may have on it, again, are, are very important. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Again, it's Chris and Callie with Canoe Kentucky. We're always here to help. Thanks for having us. So now we're going to move on to Marcus Bowling, who is the voter education specialist with the department, hey. what we'll call him. So Marcus, take it away. All right. I'll uh, start off by introducing myself. My name is Marcus Bowling. I've been a conservation officer in the state of Kentucky for going on 22 plus years now. My current uh, role is the boating education coordinator for the state. And uh, Kylie and Kurt, Kylie and Chris introduced a whole lot of information to you. And I'm going to talk to you some about boat safety because whether you're in a motorboat, a canoe, a kayak, or whatever, we have to practice safety. Uh, safety always comes first. And they alluded to the fact that when you have to register a kayak, I was going to kind of goof on you all and say, ask you all the question, do you think that you ever have to register your kayak with the state of Kentucky? But they already alluded to it, and the answer is yes. If uh, you're running an electric trolling motor or a mechanized motor on there, you have to have it registered in the state of Kentucky. Using your paddles and oars and your foot pedals, you do not have to. But if you put a trolling motor on there, you do. Uh, another important thing I want to talk to you all about is, is something called a float plan. It's something that you should get in the habit of doing. Everything with safety is a habit, but the float plan basically is, is you just basically tell somebody where you're going. Uh, it's basically the four W's, the who, what, when, and where. Um, Cause if something happens to you and there's just an emergency on the water, the first thing that we're going to do or search and rescue is going to do is to ask those questions to somebody. We're going to say, well, who are they with? Uh, where did they go? When did they go? And what time do they think they're coming back? So just get in the habit of letting somebody know in your family or a close friend say, hey, me and a couple of friends and give them their names and their cell phone numbers is a great thing to do. Uh, tell them where you're going to, where you plan on launching from, uh, what you're driving. So I'll know that if I'm looking for a Dodge, a black Dodge pickup truck, and where you're going to be at so we can start looking. Um, and what time you're coming back. You know, if you say you're not going to be back till 11 o'clock at night, well, probably midnight, nobody's going to get worried. But at 2 o'clock, people may start asking questions. So get in the habit of leaving a float plan or telling somebody who you're with, where you're going, and what time you're coming back. Uh, it's just a, a good thing to do. Uh, the most important thing, which Kelly and Chris alluded to earlier, is your life jacket. Uh, your life jacket is your first line of safety uh, when you're boating. I consider it to be like your seatbelt in a car. Um, as we most know, when you get in a kayak or you get in a canoe or a motorboat, you don't have a seatbelt. And this is also just the same thing like a habit. 
when you get in your kayak, you need to be in the habit of putting your life jacket on and keeping it on because when an emergency happens, that's going to be the first thing that protects you. So we always need to do that every time. Um, and when you do it, you'll eventually get to where you do it. I imagine if you talk to Kelly or Chris, they'll tell you that they do it and they don't even think about it. I do it and I don't even think about it because I've done it so much. There's about, there's three or four things that make your life jacket legal. Uh, the biggest and most important thing is, is that it has to be Coast Guard approved. Um, if you look at any life jacket, either in the packaging or on the inside of it, there's going to be a label and you will see the words Coast Guard approved. That is the very first thing that you have to have to make it legal. The next thing is, is it needs to be made to fit you. Uh, basically saying if you're an adult, you can't pick up a child's life jacket and say, hey, this is my life jacket. That doesn't work. Um, inside that label, usually it's rated for weight and it'll tell you like for an adult or for a youth or for a child. So make sure your life jacket fits. And then when you do get your life jacket, that is your life jacket. That needs to stay with you like it's your property. Um, and it needs to be fitted and adjusted for you. So when you go get on your kayak or you go get on the boat, it's automatically ready to go and buckle and zipped and you don't have to cinch it down. So Coast Guard approved has to fit you and the third thing is readily accessible. And in the kayak, that's going to be a little easier because your kayak, everything is right there with you. But in a bigger boat, you need to be able to get to your life jacket in a hurry. Uh, it doesn't need to be up under something, stuffed in a storage bin, or in the package that you bought it in. It needs to be where you can put your hand on it and use it. Uh, the kayak, like I said, you have all your stuff there with you, and you really need to wear it the whole time you're kayaking. Um, if you're kayaking, you need to familiarize yourself, or if you're doing anything new for the first time, you need to familiarize yourself with that. Uh, a kayak doesn't look like much, but if you get on the river with the current and low head dams and the brush and debris in the water, you can get into a lot of situations that are not too fun and you need to know how to handle them. So I'd say always go with somebody, if you're first starting out, go with somebody that's very knowledgeable of it that can show you some of the ins and outs. Most definitely you need to be familiarized with how to get yourself back in a kayak if it flips over on you. Um, you don't want the first time you do that to be in a dangerous situation. You wanna know how to get back on it as quick and in a hurry as possible. Um, and educate yourself. Even what y'all are doing today with this show is education. The more you educate yourself about a subject, the more knowledgeable you are, and the more knowledgeable you are, means you're going to be safer on the water. Um, you can go to fw.ky.gov, which is our website, and we've got some things on paddle boarding and kayaking and different things that you can educate yourself with. But life jackets, to me, is the number one thing. Um, that is the one I drive home to anybody. Wear it, as you see my logo behind me. Wear it at all times. It's going to save your life, and it needs to be functioning. Uh, if your zippers are broke or your buckles don't work or the stuffing's starting to come out of them, then it's not going to serve any function to you. If you're canoeing or kayaking, you may have a square cushion that they call a PFD. It's a top four throwable device. Just be aware if you do have that in there that that does not qualify as a life jacket for you. That is a throwable device. Yes, it's a personal flotation device, but it's not to be worn. So sometimes when I run across people canoeing, they'll have that and they'll hold that up. So just be aware that you have to have a life jacket uh, that fits on you and not a top four. Uh, another thing I've got is, is a lot of people think it's fun to take a float trip and drink alcohol. I can tell you from years of experience that drinking alcohol and boating is just like drinking alcohol and driving. They don't mix. Um, as a matter of fact, it's probably more dangerous when you're in a boat just because of all the extra stressors you have on you from being out there in the weather and the waves and everything else, it compounds problems. So absolutely no drinking while you're out kayaking. Uh, it's not, I know it sounds fun and it may be fun, but it's not a good way to lose your life. Um, the other thing is they talked about too, the kayak, fishing by kayak is getting extremely popular. Um, just remember that if you're fishing, if you're 16 years or older, you have to have a fishing license. So that's something to keep in the back of your mind. Um, fishing license, 16 or older, 
life jacket, I could dial say it a hundred times to drive that home and wear it. Um, if you put a trolling motor on your kayak, which you'll see some kayaks with trolling motors, need to have the boat registered. Um, another good thing that Callie talked about too is a whistle. Uh, if you do get in a situation, you need to be able to alert somebody to your situation. So you can get any kind of whistle that makes a shrill sound and attach that to your life jacket. And in that way, you know your whistle is with you at all times. Um, and it needs to be functioning. You, you may think it's a whistle and it may work, but every year or every time you go out, you need to check it to make sure it's working good. Any safety equipment needs to be inspected and checked every time to make sure that it's functioning. Um, in the end, fish and wildlife, all we want is for you all to boat safe on the water and enjoy yourselves and take care of yourself and others out there. Um, I talked probably pretty fast. Uh, I'll stay here and answer any questions anybody got, anybody has. Um, but that's, that's just a general quick overview of some things to do to be safe on the water, especially while you're kayaking. Um, I do have a question about the types of life jackets. Now, there's the inflatable ones, which are the thinner versions, which more people might like. What should they know about those and how they operate? Uh, Andrew's talking about a type five life jacket. They're auto inflate. Some of them you have to pull the string to manually inflate it or it will auto inflate. For kayaking, I would rather go with a top two or three. And the reason being is, is if you get in a pinch real quick and in a hurry, it's kind of like on a jet ski. It takes 15 to 30 seconds for an auto inflate to actually blow up to bring you to the surface. In an emergency, you may not want to have 15 or 30 seconds. So a top two or three, in my opinion, is going to be safer uh, while you're kayaking and canoeing. But a top five is auto inflate. And it's like Andrew said, it's nice because it doesn't take up much room. But it's got functions for it and then other functions, like I said, for kayaking may be more important for the two or a three. So we only need to register the boat as long as it has a motor to propel it, correct? Yes, and you'll get kind of caught up with that because like Callie and Chris were showing you with the pedals, that is mechanized, but that's going to be, that's we deem that to be okay and not have to have it registered. So only a trolling motor or other mechanized device. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions? Now, where can they find more info on what's required? Would that just be in the fishing guide or... Where would you suggest you can, looking you, can, you, you can go to the Kentucky Fish and Boating Guide or go to our website at fw.ky.gov and go under boating and type in or even type in the search column boating checklist. And it'll be a list of things that you need to have to keep you legal in your boat. Awesome. Thank you, Marcus. If there's any other questions, give the chat a second. And if not, I think that's all we got. Yep, that's all we got. All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, some final things to go over before we wrap up. Next week, we'll be meeting on Tuesday again for the second part of the series, which will cover how to plan your next float trip. So I assume a lot of this stuff that they all went over will come back up again. Um, the department is also currently running a giveaway. Let me get to the right slide here for you guys. So... This is a mentor program. So essentially, if you take someone new fishing who's never fished before, you can take their license number, go to the department's webpage, which we've mentioned is fw.ky.gov, go to your My Profile, and on the right side, you'll see a little tab for the kayak program, and you can enter that new person's license number and enter for a chance to win this $1,000 kayak prize package, which, you know, Callie and them, they know this boat. This is a nice boat a good paddle, life jacket, you get the whole setup, you'll be ready to go out on the water. And the mentee who you took fishing will also get a rod and reel. So you can have as many entries as you want. So every new person you take who hasn't bought a license ever or within the last three years, that's another entry for the boat that you can get. And um, if you have any questions about that, feel free to reach out to us here at the department and we'll get that all answered for you. So that's going to run through the end of the year pretty much. So and that's all I have, everybody. We look forward to seeing you all next week. If you have any questions, go on and ask now. We're here. And if you think of something later, just email me or call the department and we'll get your questions answered. Thank you guys for joining us. How can I ask a question? <coughs> you can ask right now. Um, I just got a kayak and I'm at No Lynn, if you're familiar with it, and the tailwaters. 
Mm-hmm. I'm wanting to take the trip from the tailwaters to uh, Brownsville. Okay. As in, do you know anything about that trip? I have not. I don't know if Chris or Callie or Marcus have. Um, you could probably do Google Earth and kind of see what it looks like. Now, if you find a local canoe shop like Canoe Kentucky in that area, they might know enough about it to kind of give you an idea of what you're dealing with and also the best way to check the flow rate for that area. Yeah. And, I was just wondering, yeah. I've got, pe- we've got the pedal kayaks. So I was wondering how deep it is and um, yeah. you know, get rapids or what. Um, I was going to say Lee McClellan, who we'll have on next week to plan the float trip, save yeah. that question for him because he's gone everywhere. He travels out of state and everything too. So he'd be the guy to know to get the most info about that. All right, cool. I'll be here then. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Anything else? All righty. Thanks, everybody. Thanks to all my guests. See y'all next week at 